Well, good morning, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. All the way from Dallas, Texas. It's an honor to be here on your campus today. I count it a, a great uh, privilege and honor to be here with you. I feel completely uh, undeserving of, of this honor. Uh, this is a, uh, an incredibly humbling experience for me just to get to spend uh, a few moments with you in worship and in studying God's word uh, today. Uh, you know, we share a lot of things uh, at uh, DBU between Southwestern and DBU. We share many of our faculty members, many of our students. Walking in this campus, I see that we share many of our donors, uh, Dr. Greenway. Uh, so it's an honor to come and share uh, God's word with you today. I am so very thankful for uh, the other Adam. I would, uh, I, would, I would beg to differ on the lesser Adam of, of sorts things. So uh, I really hold you in high regard, uh, my friend. Uh, Candace and I pray for you and Carla and Wade and Caroline, and that you have such a precious family, and you have such a precious family uh, here today. And uh, I've, I've been the beneficiary of professors that have come through Southwestern over the years and have served at Dallas Baptist University. In fact, one of my favorite professors when I was uh, pursuing my doctoral studies uh, reminded me something that he shared with his doctoral students uh, here at Southwestern. And I don't know if this has continued to be repeated uh, in the halls here at, at Southwestern, but he reminded us that though our salvation is received by grace through faith, our degree is received by works. And so he reminded me in his particular seminar that we will work and work hard uh, we did. And so I know the faculty here continue to uphold uh, that strong, academic, rigorous standard. And as I look out today and, and see some of those familiar faces uh, on the faculty, I want to thank you. Thank you for your warm welcome and for your prayers uh, and for your faithfulness. We need strong seminaries like Southwestern. We need strong colleges and universities, I believe, like DBU. One of the things that I share with our students often at DBU is the fact that I believe that one of the greatest cravings of our world today is a hunger for Christian leadership. And I believe that God is raising up a group of young men and women uh, to stand boldly and faithfully, uncompromising and courageously for the glory of God. And in preparation uh, for my time with you today, I, I have to admit, I was headed down one stream of thought, uh, thinking about and reflecting on the pandemic and lessons learned and, and some concepts gleaned and wanting to share those with you today. And, and I was out uh, jogging the campus and I felt that tugging, that still small voice from the Lord uh, calling the audible, uh, if you will. And, and I know that many of you have had that experience where you're headed down one uh, stream of thought and thinking and uh, you know, I had even had the outline prepared in my mind, and, and the Lord was saying, no, I want you to uh, go a different direction. And a bit of frustration, attempting to reason with the Lord, I'm asking him, show me a sign. Which do you really want me to go this direction? Today, I want to talk to you about this concept of abiding. And I'm, and I'm literally having this conversation in my mind and in my heart with the Lord. Lord, I sense your prompting to share on this topic of abiding. Is that really what you want me to share? It was in my worship time that morning with the Lord that uh, a song I'd never heard by Keith and Kristen Getty uh, came to mind. And, and the whole song was about this concept of abiding. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's like that, uh, that idea, I'm going to go out and buy a Camry. And so every time I'm on the road and the highway, what do you see? You see the Camrys passing by. So I'm thinking that, that perhaps it's just in my head. And, and it's a, a coincidence, if you will, uh, that uh, Keith and Kristen are singing the song Abide in Christ that I'd never heard. And I'm fans of Keith and Kristen, and I know they've been here. And, uh, and so I, I asked the Lord again. I almost feel a bit sinful throwing out the fleece again. Lord, are you sure it's abiding? And that morning, going into the office, checking the mail, is a note from a donor, a friend. And he has penned a handwritten note uh, on this letter, literally saying, the key to my life the last seven to eight years has been in abiding. And he underlines the word, and I think, okay, I give up. There must be something you're trying to tell me, uh, Lord. And so I believe uh, that the Lord has no doubt a word of encouragement on this topic, on this concept uh, of abiding. And there's so much 
uh, in the scripture and the word of God about this idea of abiding with Christ, of walking with the Lord. But I want to focus in on a very familiar passage uh, to I know many of you, and that's in John chapter 15, verse five. And I'm gonna spend the entire time, the short amount of time we have together this morning on this one verse. So if you will... Uh, If you will open your word of God with me, and if you'll stand as I read in honor of the reading of God's word, uh, the, the word says in John chapter 15, verse five, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The King James Version there says abide instead of remain, and I love that word abide. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Our Father, we love you, we worship you, we adore you, we claim you as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. Father, do what only you can do. Father, allow me to hide behind the cross and to profess only that which you would have me share today. Father, I pray that you would forgive me for where I've fallen short. Forgive all of us, Lord, recognizing that we are in need, a great need of a Savior to do a redemptive work, a restorative work as we renew our minds day by day for your glory and your honor alone. We thank you, Lord, for your word and how your word does not return to us void. So Lord, we echo the words of Samuel this morning. Speak, your servants are listening. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So this passage is a portion from the book of John, and I don't have to remind you seminarians that this is a part of a final discourse of sorts that is taking place here in these chapters of John. And Jesus had just had his last supper with his disciples. And this is obviously before his crucifixion. And as we reflect on this particular moment in time, with the luxury of both hindsight and insight, we're struck by the lessons, the reminders, the commands, the inspiration that Jesus gives us right before he dies this horrific death on a cross for you and for me. You know, these past few days uh, have been very reflective for me. In fact, I was, I was fighting a bit of a somber attitude, even just uh, walking uh, into the doors of, of chapel today. I, I lost a, a very dear friend. I think some of you probably know Dr. Billy Abraham, who is a, a, a giant of the faith. Uh, Dr. Billy Abraham uh, was a scholar in residence at DBU, an Irishman, uh, so much fun to be around and, and just hear him share. Oxford educated, but he had a great love for this country, for the religious freedom that we embrace and that we're attempting to preserve uh, here in America. And Dr. Abraham taught for many years at SMU Perkins School of Theology. He taught, uh, established the the Wesley House Studies at, at Truett Seminary. And now I know, I need to say that you probably think I'm a heretic for bringing up the names of those two institutions, Uh, but this was a unique Methodist man uh, that transcended in so many ways denominational lines and truly loved the Lord. He loved the Lord and he loved others. And I was with him last Wednesday. Uh, This man loved evangelism. And maybe some of you are watching online. He had a, a tremendous ministry in Romania with the Romanian people. Uh, And I love Dr. Abraham, a true scholar that received just about every award that one could receive uh, at SMU. And uh, we were talking about the Lord on Wednesday last week. I'd spent hours upon hours with this man over the last couple of years. And obviously he had no idea that he was about to pass away. But what I found myself doing the last couple of days is really reflecting on that last conversation Uh, what it was that he shared with me, the things that we talked about and really dwelling uh, on these last words that he shared uh, in my life. And I think about this particular passage of scripture where we're reading and reflecting on words that Jesus shared uh, as he's he's leading up to uh, the death on the cross. And I think we more intently go back and we read and reflect on those words even more 
discerningly, if you will, as we know and as we recognize that these are the last words of Christ before he passes on the cross, the lessons, the reminders that he's given the disciples. And so in our few moments together, I'd like to just take some time marinating on these final words in this particular verse and let them seek in and and uh, permeate on our minds and in our hearts as we reflect on the power of abiding in Christ. You know, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And one of the first points I'd like to make in this passage, this particular verse, uh, as I've reflected a good bit on this truth, is that uh, if we're to most effectively live our lives as Christians submitted to the Lordship of Christ, we must know our role well and act well our part. I teach a course uh, with a group of students in Washington, D.C. each spring, and we spend a good bit of time talking about the founding fathers. And the founding fathers in American history were just uh, enveloped in this idea of their part, their role in the world in which they were uh, set apart to play. They were obsessed with it. There was a, uh, a play called uh, Cato, written by Alexander Pope, who spoke the words, act well your part, for there all the honor lies. And I think about the obsession that the founding fathers had with acting well their part. I think about the obsession that we should have as sons and daughters of the risen king to act well our part, recognizing that all of the honor that God can bestow upon our lives is right there abiding in him, trusting in him, seeking in him, and being led by him to act well our part and to recognize that we have a very unique role to play in this world, this side of heaven, that we oftentimes confuse uh, taking on the role of something or someone else rather than fully submitting to the role that God has called us to. I have two uh, precious little ones. Dr. Greenway was kind enough to mention them a moment ago, Abigail and Kate. Abigail is 10, going on 20. Kate is eight and the life of the party. It's fun watching these two uh, grow up and do life with them. And it's been amazing to me to watch the independence that's being cultivated in the lives of these two uh, little girls. Uh, A cultivation that her mother and I are doing intentionally, but also a cultivation that's happening outside of the home when they're at school or with their friends attempting to grow this idea of independence. And we nurture and cultivate this independence in Abigail and Kate, but we're always quick to remind them that God has given their mom and dad a unique role in their lives uh, to care for them, to put a roof over their heads, to put food down before them, to really invest in their lives, to, to clothe, to feed, to shelter. And we're constantly instructing them that they're to honor their mom and their dad, as the Bible teaches, and to know that God's given us a special privilege of the role of being their parents. And yet, while we're teaching them this independence, we don't always let them decide what time they will go to bed or what they will eat because they would never go to bed and they'd eat Domino's pizza for every meal. So, as their parents, we help them understand that we have their best interests at heart and that there's a reason for bedtime and there's a reason for good nutrition And we want what's best for them as they gain more and more independence as young people. And it's amazing how smoothly life goes when your 10-year-old and your 8-year-old daughters recognizing that mom and dad play this specific role. And they have a specific role to play as the daughters of Adam and Candace. But this is a hard lesson to learn, and it's also a hard lesson to teach especially if you have kids and, and you're in the midst of, of uh, helping your children understand that lesson as well. And, and, and independence left unchecked can lead to the perils of self-sufficiency. My faith and understanding in God's word has grown so much in having children. And I look at children and see the disaster it would be for them to try to do, li- to do life without Uh, their parents, at least at at this stage in their lives. And just as I long to do life with my children, I know that God longs to do life with his children, with you and with me. And I think that we don't often spend enough time reflecting on this truth that God wants to be more than just our savior, our deliverer, and our redeemer. But he also wants to be 
our friend. And the thing is that this pitfall of self-sufficiency, it's not sudden or dramatic, but it tends to happen gradually over time, sometimes without us even realizing uh, that it's taking place. And before long, uh, we look up and we realize that we've become so self-sufficient that we filled ourselves up with the lies that the world is throwing at us. And we've exhausted ourselves with fatigues, attempting to do things for Jesus, attempting to write the next sermon or get through the next paper all on our own because we can get it done and we can do it all. And isn't that what the world wants us to believe? We somehow forget that scripture reminds us that it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. If we're to achieve success in God's eyes, it only comes through the powerful presence of the Lord Almighty, working to will and to act according to his good purpose, as the scripture reminds us. A mentor once shared with me, one that has spoken from this stage many times over the years, that self-sufficiency is spiritual suicide. The more that we come to a deeper realization of God's desired, his intended role for our lives, the better off we will be as his redeemed instrument. I love the analogy that Jesus uses here of being the vine. He is the root. He is where it all begins. And in a very agrarian culture, in a society at the time, Jesus knew the perfect words, the perfect analogy for the moment because everything flows from the vine. My little girls, Abigail and Kate, have learned the saying really quickly that where daddy goes, blessings flow. <laughs> I've learned the same truth as a child of God. I wanna go where God is going. I wanna work where he is working. I wanna be a part of his redemptive plan. But in this passage, in this verse, there's a conditional if, if in this verse that needs to be mindful, that we need to be reminded of. He says that if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. The King James Version, uh, my favorite translation of this passage is abide. The Greek word here is meno. Some of you could come up and do a lesson on the etymology of this word abide and its Greek meaning, but we know it's to reside, to linger, to dwell, to stay, uh, to, to not move past. Um, as I think about this idea of abiding, of staying, I can't help but to think about mentors in my life, perhaps mentors in yours. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't share of, of one of my mentors here. He's a Southwestern Baptist theological graduate. Uh, he is our chancellor at DBU. He served at DBU for 28 years, and I've known Dr. Gary Cook for more than 20 years of my life, and I was able to watch him closely throughout his presidency at DBU. I was able to glean lots of lessons and insights, and, and I remember going through the presidential search process at DBU uh, just a little over five years ago now. And I think the committee thought that they had uh, a little version of Gary Cook as they were uh, going through the inter interview process with me because I'd spent so much time uh, in Gary's presence, uh, learning about how he does things. And certainly we're two different people, obviously two unique uh, individuals, but I'd spent so much time I could almost anticipate how he would make decisions. And you know where I'm going with this. But Gary Cook taught me, taught me so much about following Jesus and seeking him every day. I recognize that I just don't make sense on paper. I should not be doing what I'm doing as president of Dallas Baptist University. I don't have the right pedigree. I don't have the right uh, credentials in, in my opinion of, of assuming such an incredible role. But I remember that tugging, that, that, that still small voice by the Holy Spirit to just walk with him, to follow him, to lean on him, to rest in his wisdom, knowing that he would guide me, he would lead me, and that if he would do anything at all that was worthwhile or good at DBU, it would be because we were so yielded and faithful to the work of the Lord at DBU, people would unmistakably know that it wasn't because of some kid that ascended to the presidency. It would be because of the great God working in and through his life. And Gary Cook taught me so much of that 
that it's literally become second nature for me in um, resting on the word of God and leaning on the word of God and recognizing in James 1.5 that if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask the Lord who gives it generously without finding fault. Those are the lessons I learned from following a man who is following God who taught me how to follow God. And the key action in this verse is remaining or staying with Jesus Christ, spending time with him, the daily effort of being in his word, not just studying his word to get through the next paper, not just reflecting on his word to share another sermon, but letting it dwell, letting it permeate, letting it take root in your life. A really lived out version, in a sense, of the Shema in Deuteronomy, uh, where we are talking about Christ wherever we go, where we're walking with him as, as we walk along the side of the road or when we sit down or when we lay down at night or when we have conversations at the dinner table. And, and at DBU, when I walk between buildings or perhaps even when I wash my hands, I'm thinking about Brother Lawrence and the simple tasks of life of just abiding in Christ and doing life with Christ. And when I was talking with the Lord about what to share today and asking him, actively seeking what it is that he wanted to share, he revealed that to me. But he would not perhaps have revealed that to me had I not been just spending time with Jesus. And far too often we fail to realize that God desires a love relationship with each and every one of us. Um, I love Henry Blackaby. Uh, we've had him on our campus. Uh, we have a building named after Henry Blackaby. Uh, next to the Word of God, one of the books in my life that has really shaped the trajectory of my life was the Experiencing God book that I know many of you uh, have read and gone through before. And Henry Blackaby reminds us that sometimes that we get so caught up, so busy in the doing that we miss out on the being with God and spending time uh, with the Lord, enjoying that love relationship. Um, as I share with students, as I share with undergraduate students at DBU, recognizing that approximately 90% of our students are gonna go on and they're going to serve in some type of secular vocational context, becoming Christian doctors and Christian lawyers and Christian educators and so on and so forth. My, at, my, my reminder to them is, that God wants to be with them every step of the way. He wants to have a loving relationship with them. He wants to use them a part of his redemptive work in the world in which we live. And sometimes we get so caught up in the pleasure of serving God or attempting to work hard to please him that we miss out on the joy of just being with him. I have to wonder how many promptings in life uh, how many moments that I've missed out on hearing from the Lord because I've been too caught up acting busy or being busy and doing things for God. <laughs> what I love about the word that Jesus is giving us here is that when we learn to do life with and for him, we not only bear fruit, but he says we bear much fruit. I also love that when we spend time doing life with God, we don't have to try at bearing fruit. I think too often we get caught up in this idea of trying too hard at things. Um, we see imitation out there and, and we think it's the best form of flattery and we attempt to act like um, the next best pastor or minister out there taking on their personality or their character and, and we fail to realize uh, that we're to be imitators of Christ, seeking him, pursuing him in everything that we do. You know, my parents used to tell me, uh, be careful little about the company you keep. And uh, I remember uh, those little annoying phrases that mom and dad used to share, like this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And now I find them uh, very helpful as uh, I'm raising Abigail and Kate and, and very reflective in my own life. It caused me to ask myself, what kind of company am I keeping? Am I keeping the greatest company of them all and walking daily with the Lord? Uh, spending all that time with mom and dad finally rubbed off. Uh, allowed those lessons that they shared with me growing up to permeate in such a way that I see the value of walking every day 
uh, with Jesus as my Lord and Savior. My dad, uh, he was a minister of music at a local church, Grace Temple Baptist Church, for uh, more than 17 years in his ministry. I served there as minister of education and minister of music. And I remember being a young person uh, falling in love with the hymns, literally falling in love with the hymns, believe it or not, as a young person. I took hymnology at DBU uh, because I think there's such great theology in the hymns, trying to figure out that hymn in the garden who Andy was all these years. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. Who is this Andy guy? And, and finally realizing that uh, it was Jesus that we walk with, that we talk with. And the verse says, and the joy that we share as we tarry there. Um, that whole idea of tarrying. When was the last time that you tarried with the Lord? Little things in life have a compounding impact as we make these uh, daily, moment by moment, uh, deposits in God's word, spending time in prayer with the Lord, and not getting wrapped up in this incredible work that we can do for God, but getting wrapped up in the idea that day by day, minute by minute, every second, the Lord wants to do life with us. I love D.L. Moody when he said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us willing to do the little things. The little things have a compounding impact indeed. And when we're consistent in cultivating that love relationship with Christ, we realize in a very special way the true meaning of how Christ stands at the door of our heart and knocks, waiting for him to let us in. Too often in life, we shut him out. I don't have to go through the headlines of the day. I don't have to remind you of what you're reading about in your seminars and your classes. I don't have to recount the challenges that we're facing in the world today, but I'll go back to a statement I made earlier in my comments with you, I believe that one of the greatest hungers in our world today is a craving for Christian leadership. And if, we're, if we are uh, to lead for the glory of God alone, then it must mean that we lead with him, with his presence daily in our life, not shutting him out, but allowing him in. That passage in Matthew 7, chapter 7, 22 and 23 is haunting. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not uh, drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. The hardest part of that particular verse is the part where he says, I, and for I never knew you. What a tragedy. <clears throat> I'll close my remarks with you today uh, referencing uh, a, a famous painting. Uh, it's uh, actually at Keeble College in Oxford. Each summer I have the privilege of taking groups of students and studying at the University of Oxford, in fact, staying at Regents Park College, a familiar place uh, perhaps to many of you. And, and there's a painting hanging on the side chapel at Keeble College, and it's a painting by William Holman Holm uh, Hunt. Uh, it was painted in 1853, and I think I've got an image uh, here of, of this painting to share with you this morning. And in this image, Jesus is depicted knocking at the door, and the door is representing the human soul. And you can see that the ivy has, has grown up around the door, and what you may not see is the, the image of the rusting nails and the hinges that have been overgrown by the ivy leading in to the keen observer to realize that the door has never been opened. And the figure of Christ is asking for permission to enter. And the inscription, which you cannot see on this image on the lower part of the painting, is from Revelation 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and he will dine with him and he with me. So don't be a cultural Christian that has fooled others into thinking that you and Christ are doing life together, that he and you are dwelling, that you're abiding with Christ when all you've been doing is life alone. Let's be reminded this morning that Christ stands at the door and knocks, ready to come in and take up residence, to dwell, to abide, to be with us so that his kingdom may come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
There's so much great work to be done for Jesus this side of heaven. And the best place to start is in your heart. So let me leave with this question. Where are you abiding today? Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, we thank you for the great gift of this day and your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all blessings flow. Father, we love you and we thank you for taking up residence in our life. Would you bless this seminary as it continues to surrender itself to you day by day? All of the faculties, the staff, the students, and the graduates. Father, we thank you for how you have done so much in and through the lives of the people that make up this incredible seminary. Father, we surrender ourselves to do to you to do only what you can do. Abide with us, Father. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.